I've learned that most kids learn their lesson after they get a slap on the wrist one or two times. If you were a kid like me, you didn't really learn your lesson until like the 14th or 15th time. Now, my little brother was the exact opposite. If he had done something wrong and he was corrected, he straightened up by the time that the second came around. He was that kid that most parents dreamed of, the opposite of me, and it was bad enough that I was good at getting in trouble, but my brother's good behavior showed me up even more. So, it really stood out to me when he started to become more like me. It's not that he turned bad in any capacity, but it's more like he just began getting an itch that he could not scratch. Entertaining at first, the way he suddenly wouldn't share with other kids. Then, he graduated to taking things from other kids. I thought that my brother was becoming a bully, but he never quite got to that. It was like he got this itch. I started to manifest as him eating more, like a lot more. There were times that I couldn't get seconds. My brother's transformation brought frustration to everybody. My parents were upset to see him turning into this person he wasn't. Then, the most disturbing part, his appearance began to change. My parents said that he began to look like an addict. I didn't quite understand what that meant. There were a few lines on his face that shouldn't have been on the face of a child. Discoloration, the kind you associate with restlessness, stress. We used to be able to look into those same eyes and see great kindness. We began seeing nothing but frustration, as if some urgent need couldn't be met. Nobody really knew what to make of this transformation. I was probably the least concerned, though. I was just glad that there was another bad kid in the house, and not everything was pinned on big old mean brother. It was a discovery that I made one night that truly changed how I felt. I woke up in the middle of the night, needing to use the bathroom. Nothing out of the ordinary. In order to get to the bathroom, I had to walk down the hallway, past my parents' room and my little brother's room. It was when I walked past that I felt this terrible draft. It was this piercing icy cold, as if there was an open window directly behind that closed door. For a brief moment, I even saw my breath in front of my face. On the way back to my bed, I paused in front of my brother's room. Then I didn't feel a thing. Whatever had happened, it was done and gone. Over the course of several weeks, this happened again, and I had to wake up in the middle of the night. I passed by his door and got a blast of cold air. One of those same times, I felt I decided I was going to look inside. I decided that I would be quiet and just make sure that his window was shut and that was all. What I saw when I opened the door made me freeze inside as well as out. Something was perched on the head of my little brother's bed. It had very long legs and long arms, and it was as folded up as it could be, like it was trying to perch like a vulture with folded wings. It had this emaciated shape, as if whatever it was hadn't eaten in weeks. The moonlight picked out just enough details of the head to see that it was indeed a skull, an animal skull of some kind, with antlers sprouting from its head and the points looking sharp enough to be meat hooks. Then, a heavy, cold vapor tumbled like a waterfall from its mouth. My little brother opened his eyes and he tilted his head upward toward me and smiled, holding that pose for several unnaturally long seconds. Then he sat up and smiled at me in a very exaggerated fashion, the way a child might if they feel somebody has been looking at them too long, or the way a clown might. Wide open eyes, bare teeth, open mouth. Holding that pose and face for as long as I stood there, the heavy cold vapor from the mouth of this thing behind him 
billowing around his lap, all across the surface of his bed. After that, when I had to get up to use the bathroom, I didn't dare get up unless I was absolutely about to explode. And when I was, I rushed by my brother's bedroom door for fear that it might explode open and I would see him sitting in bed with that same horrible face, looking at me, waiting for his door to open. Eventually, I stopped feeling that draft next to his door. Eventually, he went back to being normal, that my parents knew at least. Eventually, there was no longer a bad kid under our roof for me to relate to even a little bit. I guess whatever possession, whatever demon that thing was, ultimately didn't find what it was looking for. Why it let him go and stop possessing him is far beyond me. Now, whether it truly was a demon and he needed an exorcism, I don't know. I don't really believe in the paranormal or anything of that nature, but I can't deny what I saw and what I saw and how it changed my little brother. I'm not legally allowed to disclose my last name, but let's just say there's probably a chance you've heard of me or my family. We're synonymous with money and power and fame. Like any other brood of rich people, we had reproduced prolifically, which meant that there was more than enough drama and tension to go around. Not the least of which was who was going to inherit so-and-so's money when so-and-so finally bit the dust. You think it might just be the stuff of movies, but I'm sad to say it does happen in real life. That's, after all, why it is in the movies. It's so ridiculous, it automatically makes an amazing script. All you have to do is pretend you are making a documentary, and it becomes a comedy, or whatever the hell else is popular these days. Suffice to say that the oldsters with all the real gold tucked away decided that people like me and the family were far too soft and had no idea what hard work was. They don't know what hard work was either, but I couldn't afford to tell them that. And they developed a little rite of passage to inheriting their riches when they would be gone. They decided that the whole lot of us should spend 90 days in a remote location. The only difference between that and one of the reality shows is there wouldn't be a camera, there wouldn't be a script, and no safety net. If we starved or froze to death, it was on us. Nobody cared. Nobody was going to come and rescue us. So, there were five of us total, and I think three of them were surprised that we weren't going to set up a new reality show. These grown men, suddenly, looking like children that had heard they weren't going to have video games or ice cream for a very long time. The cabin in which we stayed in wasn't too remote, the only way we'd been in trouble is if we had an exceptionally bad snowstorm. The television, being very small, as was most everything else about the cabin, it was comfortable, of course. I had a feeling they were going to have a harder time winning their inheritance. Then it happened. The worst snowstorm to hit in the entire area in 30 years cut through and dumped on us completely. We weren't just snowed in because of the neighboring roads. We were snowed in because our cabin was literally buried. Keep in mind, this location, while private, is very remote and vast in the wilderness. There ain't anybody around here. I mean, we're miles and miles out. I was the last one that woke up and opening the front door to discover a solid wall of white barricading us all in. Communications were down, and we could not make any kind of calls. Every last cell phone tower, not giving us the service we need. It must have been out of commission. The food that we were supposed to receive to replenish our supplies for the last leg of our trial by fire wasn't going to make it, and there was no way our food supplies were going to last long enough. We tried to make what we had last. Too many of us, though, were undisciplined completely foreign to the notion of suffering or deprivation, and after a few days of doing without, they would give in 
and eat as much as they could before somebody slapped them down. The things about people that are born with a silver spoon in their mouths that we normally think are funny can take a very dark turn when survival is the key. And these men that had been by my side as children, spending Christmas together, Thanksgiving dinner, outings, climbing the ladder to fame together, they were suddenly looking like wolves, wild beasts that would take everything for themselves and leave you to starve without a twinge of conscience. It only reinforced the brutality behind the words of our elders before this entire thing began. Nobody was going to get us out. People became what they centered their lives around. And here, I was trapped in a cabin with people raised in a family that centered their lives around cold, hard cash. And that was just the beginning. Our firewood was also part that had been buried in the snow outside. Digging our way out to it was one ordeal. Getting it to burn was another. We were colder and hungrier than we had ever been. That's when I woke up one morning to one of them, dead. He lay in bed with his face, with a sickly color of blue. One by one, the others came to the room and then immediately had to leave as they realized what had happened. All except for one. He lingered just a little too long, staring just a little too hard. And a strange thought had entered my mind when I saw his behavior, but I could not think there would be anything to it. I would find out that night that my glimmer of a hunch was correct. I woke up in the middle of the night feeling more than just a biting cold. I also felt like something was extremely fearfully wrong. The air had a charge to it, and even after I got on my bed, it felt like I had a weighted blanket thrown over me. The cold wasn't just pressing in on my skin. It was somehow reaching down deep into my bones, and I shivered violently, almost to the point that I could not walk. It was as still as a tome in that cabin, and I could hear strange sounds coming down the hallway of the room where my dead relative lay. The room where there shouldn't have been any sounds at all. I somehow knew what I was going to find, but it was too horrendous for my conscious mind to entertain. I went in there to investigate, and there was the youngest among us, with blood staining his face as he ate away at the dead body. His whole manner was that of a ravenous wolf, rather than a reluctant survivalist. I screamed at him to stop and what he was doing. Clearly, he had turned insane from food and cold deprivation. He had turned his face toward me, and his eyes were completely whited out. He gave me a hiss that no human should be able to create. There was even a slight rattle to it. His teeth looked different, his nails longer, he was just the right angle, and I could see the reflection in one of the small windows. I'm telling you now, I'm not entirely sure what I saw, but I saw something with antlers and much less meat on its bones. We tried to restrain him, and he mauled all of us to a greater or a lesser degree. Finally, in a display of superhuman speed and strength, he plowed through the snow that was barricading the front door minus the small tunnel we had carved out to get wood. That was the last we ever saw or heard of him. Our elders pretended to be appalled to find out what happened. We were starved shipwrecks of human beings by the time anybody was able to get out to us. I can tell though that they were laughing and perhaps on some deep down level, they would never admit they were happy that there was one less person fighting to get the money. I know that what I saw was not some hunger-induced hallucination. That's when my research began, and when I discovered the term Wendigo for the first time. Since all this, I've been undergoing severe psychiatric treatment ever since, and I've rambled to my therapist about everything that I read about Wendigos, especially the part that their turning doesn't always happen when they first taste human flesh. Sometimes, it begins far before with intense greed, selfishness, especially 
when it's to the point that it's destructive towards others, including themselves. Not surprisingly though, nobody takes me seriously. I'm just another rich brat that got bitten too hard by the real world and is having trouble coping. Again, I apologize for not disclosing my name, but if you dig long enough, you'll find a well-known celebrity family who is mysteriously down one person. This is the closest I'll be able to tell the world exactly what kind of people are in power. The kind of people that have all the money. Because if everything I've read is true, then everybody in my family is a Wendigo waiting to happen. Just when I thought that I wasn't going to see anything worth shooting, a buck worthy of the cover of a field and stream magazine began to strut out into the open, and the only thing I could think of as I was drawing my bow was the scripture that says that pride goeth before a fall, because this one looked awfully pleased with himself. I let the arrow fly, and it hit the buck through the side. There's no way that it had missed his lungs. He bound away, but I knew it was only a matter of time. After all, hunting in Texas is a mixed bag. Sometimes, you feel like you're in the Amazon, while other times, you feel like you're in the Sahara. This was one of the more desert-like landscapes. I had a wide open view of my prey, and he seemed to have known that, because he went straight down for the mouth of a very small cavern. Unless that little pocket of underground air led into a huge complicated system, it almost wasn't even worth knocking another arrow. All I would have to do is go in with my buck knife and finish the job. Sorry, but yes, I can be one of those hunters. I didn't have a chance to fully put away my bow, because the deer came running out of the cave with a renewed speed. Something that looked like a cross between an oversized hawk and a man had its talons dug into its back, and it was trying for all of its worth to take off with this buck in the air. But, like an owl that tries to pick up a goat, the monstrosity had clearly bitten off more than it could chew. While it was wrangling the deer, I got a pretty good look at the scene in front of me. This creature only bore a rudimentary resemblance to a human being. The rest was straight up some kind of animal that I couldn't correctly categorize. The face came close to a bat, if a leaf-nosed bat had escaped some mad scientist gallery of failed experiments. This thing was way bigger than it should have been. Its overall cast suggested that it wasn't used to standing up straight, but if it had, I feel like it could have easily been seven feet tall. It flapped tattered and leathery wings madly, trying to carry off its oversized cargo to wherever its lair was. That's when I had suddenly lost interest in bagging that deer, and instead wanted to try and make a trophy out of whatever the hell this was. I attempted to steady my nerves and shrug off the shock of seeing this thing. Everything about it brought back everything I had ever seen and heard in connection with things like hell, vampires, Dante's Inferno, everything in between. The creature must have been smarter than I gave it credit for, because when it saw me draw my arrow back, it knew, or seemed to know that I was aiming at it, and it then abandoned the deer, flying upwards. My arrow gouged a new hole in its already damaged wing, but it cried out and beelined for my head. I was just fast enough to duck, and got a fresh, deep wound from my ear to my eyebrow. That's when I could feel hot blood running down my face. It attempted two more passes at me, each one inflicting another deep wound. I knew I wasn't going to be able to hunker down and wait for the whole thing out. So, I brought up my buck knife again, and the next time it came for me, I slashed at it. I do hit something. I don't know what. There was a scream, and it made my blood go cold. I felt a warm hot liquid that wasn't mine splashing over my hands. 
it circled a few feet above me before flying off. That's when I finally collapsed. I looked over to the deer and saw that it had finally succumbed to its own wounds. That's when I finally got to assess just how badly I was hurt. And, unfortunately, I was in worse shape than I had thought. I wasn't ready to kneel over dead anytime soon. Still, I thought better of taking the extra time to take the deer home. Instead, I went straight home and saw to my injuries. I just didn't feel for the deer as strongly as I had before. The more impressive trophy had gotten away, and I can't remember the last time I was deathly afraid of that very thing that I was hunting to make a trophy out of. Maybe someday I'll gather up the gumption to go out there specifically after that thing. I do remember the cave that it came out of. It shouldn't be too hard to find again. Wish me luck and hope I don't die. I know this might sound strange to you, but I prefer to call myself a professional exorcist. I am also an atheist. As long as I don't mention the last detail when I'm on the job, people never catch on. You don't have to necessarily be religious to burn sage and chant a bunch of stuff that you got written down and just simply perform a few little theatrics to indicate that you can feel the evil leaving the premises. Besides, a child actor could easily do the same things that I do and land a steady job. There was one incident on the job where, very briefly, I wasn't an atheist. You'll never get me to admit that, though, in person. Going back, I got a phone call from what sounded like a very frantic old man. It turned out, it was actually a Catholic priest that headed a church not very far away from where I live. For all his divine authority, he was having trouble with an entity that just wasn't giving him the respect his office commanded, and even held fast to his audacity to squat in the church's upper chambers. I told him, refusing to call him father. I was not an altar boy with daddy issues. What manner of creature do you need to exercise? He then told me with gusto that it was a demon from hell. How it had terrible curved horns, tattered wings. I almost suggested that he take its pitchfork from it and ram it through its neck. I was hungover, wasn't in the mood, and thought he was pulling my leg. But paying work is paying work, I thought. So I agreed to come out and see what I could do about one of Satan's mini-me's. I thought that maybe the priest was ribbing me with a little bit of over-the-top theatrical humor. That's when he took me inside the church, led me to the stairwell that led into the upper levels. He was very reluctant to go up there with me. He told me that the demon was not to be underestimated, as it had already tried to make off with some of the children in the congregation. I was just barely able to restrain myself from saying that I would trust a demon with my children before I would trust him. I breached the upper levels with an electric torch. Indeed, it hadn't looked like people had been up there for a very long time. And yet there was slightly disturbed feel to it that hinted that there was regular movement of some kind. Not just from people. I set about burning sage and parading some smudge sticks throughout those cold, dark halls. I was about to begin the ritualistic prayers of sanctification when a shrilling cry pierced my ears. My apathy and attitude evaporated nearly instantly. Turning around, just in time to see a great blackness with two red eyes rushing toward me from down the dark hallway. This was right before I was knocked to the floor. My lantern lit up the thing's horrible view. The LED light turned its long fangs to a blue. I landed on my back and the wind was nearly knocked out of me. There was a great flapping above me, and it sounded like thunder, and something cut into my sides. My attacker disappeared down the other end of the hallway, and I scrambled to then get myself together. I was bleeding from my sides where great claws had clamped down on me. I suddenly understood 
why the priest looked and sounded like a frightened child. Now, I'm a walking collection of warding holy relics at any given moment, and this thing wasn't deterred in the least. I felt exposed. Imposter syndrome. The simple fact that I was suddenly thinking of things I was carrying as holy, and possibly actually having protection, told me that the religion virus was seeping into my brain, which only made me even more afraid. I pulled out my Glock, and not a moment too soon. The horrible shadow was coming back up from the direction it came, and my shots lit up the hallway with the only light around. This thing screamed out, and veered to the right, where a stained glass window let colored moonlight seep in. The glass shattered, and I heard it take off. I don't know if it scrambled, jumped off, or flew off. I don't know where it went, but it never came back. I don't know if I necessarily got rid of it, but I certainly chased it off. That particular church's business of having to deal with that was at an end. My faith in nothing was restored when I contemplated how the bullets seemed to do a lot more than anything else I kept on me. It also led me to contemplate further that the creature probably hadn't come from hell at all, but possibly some dark corners of the earth where things like it were left undisturbed and allowed to breed and live in relative peace from seclusion of humanity's Hey, I love listening to your podcast. I'm a trucker and I drive for long hours at a time, often straight through the night. The stories your listeners send in are very fascinating and keep this one old dude happy whilst I'm driving through the middle of nowhere. I have enjoyed listening for some time now. I never thought that I would have something to actually send in myself to tell you about. Let's be honest. I'm still not entirely sure what I saw, but if anybody might be able to help, I figured it would be you, and if I'm lucky, your listeners. So, with the content on your channel, we've all heard of a werewolf, and thank the sweet lord that wasn't what I saw. At least I don't think it could have been, since I'm still here to tell you about it. So, I'll set the story up. I was just driving along, in the middle of listening to one of your shows, actually, if you can believe it. I think it was a Skinwalker Encounter episode. Anyway, I was engrossed, and I had been going at decent speed, trying to make sure I'd get my destination on time. But I had to hit this backwoods kind of road, due to road closures, and I gotta slow down, as I don't want to end up crashing the rig from going too fast. There's all these signs up too for various animals to watch out for. Even though I'm going to come off best, it makes a ton of mess when you run into a coyote. Trust me, I have ended up running over a pack of them before. It's a gory bloody mess. Not a lot of fun. So anyway, I'm being careful, and my lights pick up on something not too far ahead. You know the way they light up an animal's eyes like a pair of tiny beacons letting you know they're there. Only, the first thing I noticed was that these eyes weren't low down and close to the ground. These eyes that I was looking at were really high up, so whatever had caught the beam of light was either really tall or somehow clinging to one of the tree trunks. Either on this side of the road, that was for sure not made up for semis. And then the outline of this animal comes into view the closer I get and I could see for certain that this animal was indeed bigger than I could have ever imagined. Also, from the way it stood, it seemed to appear to be on its hind legs, like a dig when it's begging for food. The closer I get, the more unsure I was as to what this could have been. I crawled past it, as slow as I could manage to rig to get without causing it to spin. And let me tell you, I got to see what it looked like. It looked to be like some sort of crossbreed of an animal. I'm not sure what. It was large and stocky, but it kind of looked like a bear, and also kind of resembled a wolf in the head. 
I was right so far that this thing was huge. And again, I can't help but emphasize the strong, stocky body. It was covered in black hair, and even standing up it looked weird. But, this is the kicker. The face was horrendous, very ugly. It looked like an actual wolf head, but the face was something else. It was like somebody had come along and spliced DNA together between a man, a bear, and a wolf. Uh, trust me, I know it sounds ridiculous, but that's what I saw. I had to kind of cock my head and then turn around just to make sure I wasn't seeing things. After I turned, it lumbered off back in the woods. Listen, I hate driving through them places. I'm always thinking of stuff like this. Deliverance, wrong turn, you know. But I never would have thought I'd seen my very own cryptid. What exactly did I see? Was this a werewolf? Or was this something else? Maybe a skinwalker? I took my fiance horseback riding as an almost married present. We looked at the trail where it split off in a fork and then rejoined. So, we decided that I would go one way and she would go the other and we would see who would meet up at the junction first. I was by myself for several minutes and things seemed to be going just fine. My horse didn't seem to have any issues listening to me. But then my horse froze and I didn't know why. I was following all the directions of the guide and I didn't want to resort to using the spurs. When I looked up, I froze also. The creature that I was looking at had to have been standing at least 12 feet tall. In that intense moment, I almost thought it was just as wide. Its lips were curled in a snarl, and saliva dripped copiously from its scythe-like teeth. The proportions initially struck me as wolfish, especially the long bushy tail. The growth of fur on the cheeks looked like they were taken directly from the poster of a Wolfman movie from back in the days. The long snout looking just as canine, but the sheer size of everything was so overdramatized. It was like a bear on steroids, designed to kill and tear, with the added agility of a wolf. No bear could arch its back in such a sinister manner, and glower from beneath its eyebrows the way this thing did. My horse was petrified, and so was I. In a manner that it was all too casual, it strode up to me, and it gripped the neck of my horse with one large paw wrapping around it. And like something out of a cartoon, it pulled the horse out from underneath me, and I fell to the ground, just like a sack of grain. That's when the urge to move suddenly seized my horse. But by then, it was far too late. It battered the nose of the monstrous thing with all four hooves. And the thing looked like it tickled more than anything else. It took a huge bite out of the horse, like it was an apple, and the horse screamed and wailed in agony. The monster didn't seem to care for the sounds the horse was making, so the next bite was right on the horse's neck where the head was, which, like biting into a stick of celery, snapped it off. I wanted to scream in absolute terror as my survival-rigged brain just saw myself in place of the horse and was commanding my body to get up and bolt. But I couldn't. I couldn't even scream, nor could I make a sound. I couldn't even move an inch. I blacked out, and I awoke to the side of my fiancé, looking at me like she'd seen a ghost. A glance showed that the remains of the horse were thrown in a heap nearby, mangled, bloody. I was drenched, and I smelled horrible. It occurred to me that I had been urinated on. This thing pissed on me. I guess that was an official announcement that I wasn't appetizing. Afterwards, I went on to develop an anxiety disorder with strange triggers. I was not only triggered by dense woods and trails, but also by horses. My rational mind thought it was ridiculous, but my nervous system had made up its own mind. I've taken my fiancé horseback riding again since then. 
I just haven't done any by myself. Now, I sit in the lodge or whatever is nearby with a cup of coffee, trying to steady my nerves. I was busy one time walking my dog at the edge of the woods, towards the edge of town, when I saw something pretty crazy. We live close to a really large mountain range, so you gotta be careful. It isn't exactly unheard of to come across bears, wolves, and cougars, so you have to have your wits about you. After all, cougars especially will pounce when they get a chance to. And we've already had issues with neighbor's small dogs disappearing. So, I know they're very much around this area. Thankfully, these particular woods where people tended to take their pets didn't have too many sightings, so we were pretty safe, but we always remained on alert. Typically, we were quite far in when I heard a growl that sounded distinctly like a bear. I grabbed my dog's leash, and she began shaking frantically. I could hear movement not too far in front of us and to the side, although it seemed to be pretty low to the ground for a bear, so I was hoping it might be a young one. Maybe not a cub, because that means a mom is nearby, but a juvenile would be easier to deal with. You never want to meet a bear cub, as you know the overprotective mama will be very close by, which feels like a death sentence. Anyway, my dog was whining and shaking, and I'm wondering whether we should just run when I see the back of the thing making the noise. And now I'm confused, but no less scared as it looks like a small wolf. I could see its long tail as it turns slightly. I can make out the canine body and grayish coloring. I'm still thinking we should just run when it turns fully and faces me. I took one look, and I didn't care whether I was meant to show dominance, back away, slow or what. I pulled the dog by the leash, and we ran all the way back to the car in which I jumped, threw the dog in, and off we went. It was only when I got home that I allowed myself to fully process what I'd seen. You see, although the thing of the body had been small, when it turned to look at me, it was more resembling a bear. It kind of had a mix of a face. The skull was wide like a bear, but the snout was kind of like a wolf. It had tiny, tiny beady eyes, but long, sharp pointed ears. The body was strange, I don't even know how to tell you. Don't ask me how any of this is possible. Perhaps it's a new kind of predator, or maybe some mixed species of animal. I don't know. Part of me even played over the possibility that a wolf had killed a bear, but that's just crazy. What did I see? The first time I ever found a dead thing was also the first time I ever had an unexplained encounter. It happened about 10 years ago, and it still freaks me out to this day. See, I grew up in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by nothing but forest, not friends, not a lively neighborhood, trees, and nothingness. I was very used to wildlife, and all the animals that came to visit and lived around there. But, aside from the odd bit of roadkill, which my mom was always quick to zoom past, I hadn't ever actually came across something that was dead whilst on my own, up and close. Hear me out. I must have been in junior high school at the time, and was taking an AP English in creative writing. I wanted to get the best grades possible. So, I had to take a notepad, pen and paper, and head out into the forest. Our teacher was always telling us to write on something. I wanted to immerse myself in the forest. I was feeling pretty great. All sorts of ideas were flowing when a really nasty smell suddenly smacked me. And just as I walked past the next tree, I saw what was behind it. I'm pretty sure I found the source of the stink. It was a dead deer, but not just a body lying there, looking asleep like quite often we'd see by the side of the road. This deer had been ripped apart. In fact, 
I only knew it was a deer, as the head, which was not on the body, appeared untouched, asides from no longer being attached to its neck. The rest of it was all mangled, with bits of its insides all strewn about, and chunks of bloody flesh scattered all over. I stood there, staring at it for a moment, thinking what on earth could cause such destruction. And then, I heard a sort of rumbling noise. Now, we might live near a forest, and there are plenty of predatory animals about, but we don't have anything too serious like bears, or what this first sounded like, a large wolf. Nevertheless, you come across that sort of carnage, and then hear a low growl. It's big time scary. All I was armed with was a notepad, bottle of water, and a pen. Nothing to protect myself. That's when I immediately was drawn to rustling behind the trees in front of me. And I saw it. It was probably around six foot tall. It looked clearly humanoid and walked on two legs. In fact, the whole creature looked like it needed a good meal, just due to how scrawny it was, despite being obviously responsible for the destruction that laid in front of me. It was covered in a really mangy, shaggy-looking fur. It kind of had a red hue to its fur color, but mainly brown. And its spine was crooked, like it had really bad scoliosis, with a head and face that was very much so reminiscent of what I would call a hyena. And that's when it just stared me down, and it looked pretty pissed. The best guess I can say is its expression read that I was interrupting a very serious meal, and if I didn't want to become the next portion of dinner, I should probably leave. I kept checking behind me to see if it was following like in a horror movie, and hopefully there weren't more with it, but I didn't attempt to make any move away from the deer. I left, without it bothering me, luckily. A few weeks later, I did go back to that same location, like part of me wanted to prove what I had seen was real. I didn't see that messed up creature again, and there wasn't any more ripped up bodies or dead carcasses, but I did find what was left of the deer. Just bones. I know what I saw was real. Again, this was a person-sized hyena, every bit as terrifying as I can describe it. I have a really embarrassing dog, and so far, he likes to hump everything. He had been to the vets and had his special operation, so he can't really cause any harm, just embarrassment. And when I say he likes to share with love with everything, I do mean everything, not just other dogs. There is nothing this dog won't hump, including tree trunks and other things that he finds in the woods. So you can imagine why walks can be pretty stressful and why I try and find more remote spots for us to go. If he takes a liking to a tree trunk, he can have at it without me having to explain to some owner that he is just a lover, but there won't be any puppies. So anyway, I managed to find this spot with a lot of trees and not a lot of people or other dogs. We'd be going there for a couple of months and things were swell for the most part. He could run off, do whatever, and there was literally nobody else about. Some of the shame, at least, appeared to be lifting. Of course, I always knew he'd meet his match. He's a mongrel mix, kind of average size, but maybe like German Shepherd, so big enough to add extra torment when he takes a liking to smaller dogs. We'd always joked that one day, he'd try it on with something like a buck and get a good kick in the face. When he came running back to me that day, tail between his legs, whining, and an obvious bite mark on his back, my first thought was he'd gotten away and gotten into more than he'd bargained for. I was, though, super curious and wanted to go over and see what it was. He was acting really weird, cowering, and I couldn't drag him back to the trees. So, what I saw next would terrify me. What was on all fours, you would obviously expect from an animal, but it didn't look right. And then I saw why. Because it came out to stand in front of the trees, and then stood up on two legs, 
just like a man. This animal was covered in fur, a similar color to mange. Unlike my dog, though, it looked very comfortable and natural standing on two legs, and even the arms were just dangling by the sides like they were meant to be there, not on the floor. A natural human posture coming from an animal. Very disturbing. Oh, and by the way, the bite mark on my dog's back that I saw originally was pretty bloody. Whatever bit into him bit in pretty deep. He had to end up going to get his stitches, but that's for later on. Even this thing's head was similar. It looked kind of like a German Shepherd, but its face was somewhat human. And whereas my boy has a dopey expression on his face, this thing just looked mean. Not just the sheer size, but it had a very angry aura around it. Once it saw us, it began baring its teeth and growling. I yelled out. My dog barked, and we ran, and we ran, and we finally got back to the car. Now, I need to find a new place, because I don't want to invest in one of those long retractable leads and hope my dog doesn't upset any other men's dogs. Or we run into that creature again. That was scary. And while I don't believe in fairy tales or werewolves, I can't deny there aren't things out there that will attract themselves to other animals. Like my dog, for instance. I believe it wanted to turn my dog into dinner. Make it its prey. I grew up on a ranch. It was just like something out of an old cowboy movie, and I loved it. It was a dream like childhood. I always felt comfortable with the horses. They are kind, gentle creatures, and extremely loyal and protective. I never felt afraid when I was there, and I never left. Other kids in the town went off to college, moved away. I just always felt safe happy, secure, and fulfilled with the horses, which made what happened when I saw him all the more frightening. Even though my parents were both still alive and well, they were getting on a bit, and I had more or less taken over the entire day-to-day -day management of the ranch, allowing them to just enjoy being there, and kind of retire for the most part. At the time, we had about 10 horses, most of them having been there for several years. My favorite of them all, a mare, her name's Sandy, which I was taking extra special care of. At first, when I heard them nickering and stomping around early in the morning, about one to two in the morning, I actually thought Sandy might be in labor. So I hurried down to the stables. She was fine. No signs of starting her journey to becoming a mother just yet but the others were acting strange. They were acting as though something had tried to get into the stables, huddled at the back of their stalls, as if trying to get as far away as possible from the opening of the barn. We do get the odd coyote sniffing around sometimes, and with a baby on the way, I knew I needed to be extra vigilant. So, I kept the main barn doors closed to keep them safe inside, and decided to do a quick check. Not before grabbing my shotgun first. I never had to kill one. Usually a warning shot was enough for them to run away. And as soon as I got closer to the fencing that surrounds the property and leads out towards a huge forest, I began to feel uncomfortable. I could genuinely feel something watching me. I don't want to fire off a shot unless I had to, since the horses were already spooked and just starting to calm down. Besides, just because I could feel something didn't mean there was something there. Maybe the anxiety from all the stables was just getting to me. I checked all around where the coyotes usually try to get in, but there was nothing around the fence. Having been focused on looking at the ground, when I finally looked up and towards the trees behind the property, I screamed. I may as well shut off several rounds on the gun, that was practically how loud I was screaming. Because standing there on the other side of the fence, I could just make out through the shadow a shape, a very tall shape, 
two bright glowing amber eyes watching me, scanning me, checking me out. My first thought was it was a person, but in a split second, my brain rationalized that this wasn't a person. Even though it maintained the shape and size, this was far more terrifying. Shooting at a coyote is one thing. I genuinely wasn't sure if I could shoot a person though. This thing didn't seem to be moving any closer. Just standing there, observing, just like playing a game of chess. This thing was observing, taking the time to take on the situation and make a strategic move. And due to how dark it was, I could make out the outline of their body and the eyes. Then, it emitted a very low rumbling growl. I couldn't hear or see anything aside from me and this thing, except for the horses. The shadows seemed to move a little, and then I heard a couple of barks. By now, I was so genuinely freaked out, the only thing I could think of doing was to aim the gun and fire off a warning shot. That's when there was about a split second of light, and I screamed again, as now I saw the outline of what I thought was originally a man, because although the body looked relatively human, the head was more likely than that of a dog. It screamed at me again, a loud, horrible, rumbling scream. Then it shot down to all fours like an animal, and ran off faster than I've ever seen in my life. I genuinely don't even think I've ever been so terrified. When it ran away, it began crashing through the tree line and the trees. I could hear it. It sounded like you took a 20-foot linebacker and had them running at full speed into the forest. It was so loud. I went back to the stables, and I stayed there with the horses all night, tried to reassure them with my presence. The next day, Sandy gave birth, and I continued to sleep in the stables with them for the coming weeks. I don't know what that thing was, but if that thing had came for Sandy, she would be gone, and I wasn't going to take any future chances. Thankfully, I've seen nothing of it since. The day was well along, and it became a rather boring day to be a park ranger in southern Illinois. And actually, most days it's boring to be a ranger here in southern Illinois. But this day had been especially uneventful. No suspicious looking people. No harsh odors suggesting secret meth labs. I had all but completely given up on the notion of seeing any action when a woman ran right in front of my patrol car. And if I had been half a second slower on the brakes, I would have creamed her. I was out of that car in an instant, asking her what was going on. She was in complete hysterics and almost could not even communicate in complete sentences. I was able to piece together that she was running from somebody and that they were close on her heels. I could also make out the words that he was trying to kill her. So I drew my pistol and turned to face the direction she was pointing at. There was nobody. I looked at her, shrugged my shoulders, expecting some kind of joke. She pointed and yelled even more frantically, telling me to turn around and stop him. He was right there. I looked again, and there was nobody. She panicked and ran off, leaving me standing and staring. I waited for somebody to run by, but nothing happened. About two hours goes by, and my walkie-talkie crackles. It was the chief. He told me to come to the central lodge right away and be ready to answer some very uncomfortable questions and explain myself. I knew better than to question him over the walkie. I made the journey to the appointed destination, wondering what I could have possibly done wrong. Other than that crazy lady, nothing else had happened. The day had been pretty much dead, when I arrived at the lodge, there was the crazy lady, with her hair in her hands, clutching at it furiously. She was speaking to two other officers, and there were four, maybe five squad cars in total. I can remember the chief eyeing me, with anger in his eyes. 
I asked him what was going on. He informed me that according to this woman's statement, she had gone to me for help, and I refused. I just let the maniac they had apprehended chase after her without interfering. I asked him what maniac was he talking about. I hadn't seen anybody when I was dealing with her. He gave me a look, incredulously, and asked me if I was blind, pointed at the back seat of the squad car closest to us. I looked at the indicated car, and again there was nothing there. I looked at the chief, waiting for some joke, some prank. Maybe I'd have to explain all of this, but there was nothing. The chief continued his stern and serious look. I then turned to the woman, and there was no indication that nobody, nothing was a joke. She was a complete and utter mess, while she was being continued to be questioned. The chief told me to go ahead and go home, and to consider looking into a different line of work, since I couldn't even aid a woman who was in danger. I was now turning angry. If I was supposed to be amused, I wasn't. This was being taken way too far. I waited until the chief had his back turned, reached under my pant leg, pulled out my knife that I like to keep close. I opened the back seat of the squad car and I stabbed the seat repeatedly and made a bunch of exaggerated ripping and tearing motions at the empty air, especially where a throat and groin would be. The woman was the first one to see what I was doing and her jaw dropped. The officers followed her gaze and so did the chief and they imitated her to the look of shock. That's when I looked at them shrugged and said, Hey, if you get to murder my career, I get to murder your cheap joke. Well, currently, I am writing this story to you from prison. I am currently under intense psychiatric evaluation. I have vehemently maintained that there was nobody in the back seat and that there was nobody chasing that woman, that it all has to be one large joke. In fact, some of my colleagues have shown me pictures of the back seat of the squad car, the only explanation I have is that they painted it in synthetic blood after they took me away. The body handcuffed and slumped in the back seat as a hired actor. They showed me my blood-stained clothes that had been taken as evidence. I'm still waiting for somebody to come forth and tell me that this was all been one big elaborate joke. Maybe I'm the crazy one. Maybe working that job makes you go insane. I was busy getting into my car to start a new day of the glorious obscurity that is being a ranger. This is when I saw something that had been placed directly under my windshield. It was a small wooden doll, about the size of my thumb. The head was in proportion to the body, but it got my attention right away, and it was the fact that the doll looked awfully a lot like me in the face, likely carved with a knife. Somebody had captured my likeness. It was kind of creepy, but also cool. I couldn't exactly think off the top of my head who I knew that had this kind of talent. I checked in at the lodge for a coffee break several hours after, and when I approached the coffee machine, I saw yet another wooden figure. It looked just like me, except this one had been burned so that the wood was ashy and black. My eye sockets had been left untouched, so they were lighter color, giving the figurine a very creepy cast. I asked around about it, and nobody really had an answer. All two people in the lodge, the lady answering the phones and the janitor, had clearly no idea who had left it, nor had they seen anybody come in. I went back on patrol, trying to brush it off and not think about it. I pulled over to pick up a bag of trash that had been carelessly left by roadside. And no sooner had I touched the bag, I felt the warm push of an explosion behind me. Something had detonated inside my car. Something on the level of an IED. The world at the time felt like it was moving in slow motion for several long seconds. If I hadn't gotten out of the car to pick up that garbage, I wouldn't be here. 
I reacted in further alarm to see that I was bleeding. I figured that some shrapnel from the vehicle had caught me in the side next to my pocket. After all, as much blood as there was, all my flesh appeared intact. There was nobody around, so I had zero issues with pulling down my pants to look at all the wound more carefully, but I couldn't find any such thing. It dawned on me then that the blood was not mine nor coming from me. I looked at my burnt figurine, and the blood was coming from the figurine. From its eyes, I looked at the blood in total disbelief, and it was real blood. I could smell the iron. That's when I lost it. My vision began to blur. I had to sit down. Naturally, there was an investigation, but nothing turned up. The only thing they found out that was the blood coming from the statue was real blood, and nobody had a real rational explanation. To this day, I do not know if those figurines were a warning or a threat, but the way I see it, it was blind luck that I got out of my vehicle to get that trash. I find myself fighting back heart palpitations every time I get in my car now. I might be retiring soon, as I need a safer place and a much safer career. One of the creepiest things I've ever discovered when I was on night patrol as a park ranger, we had upped our nighttime security because unfortunately, we had a large uptick of suicide. It isn't exactly uncommon, but a tragedy for the family left to grieve and also not nice for the poor rangers like us who find them. Let's just say gunshot to the head versus hanging. There is almost no contest as to which is worse to come across. Anyway, after having had three within as many as a few months, we were trying to do more to make sure nobody was hanging about the park. There was a campsite, but that was only a slightly different part, and we weren't allowing any single campers or alcohol on site just to try and help. At this time, it was my fourth night shift in a row, and so far so good. Nights aren't my favorite shift to pull, but the bosses were offering a bonus for anybody who could pull a double, and my kids at the time were in high school. Anything to add to their college pot was more than helpful. So, there I am, 4 a.m., wandering through the trees with my flashlight, trying to make sure no one had hidden in there, and yet there was nobody with a gun to their head. You had to maintain a little humor about it, or you'd simply go crazy. That was when I heard the noise. The noise we all dread more than the bang of a gun. The creaking of a tree. The swooshing of a body hanging from a tree. I called out, shining my light all around, trying to locate where they were. I knew that sound all too familiar. It seemed to be coming from all around, but the force can do that. Almost like it's trying to disorientate you. There was no answer. Not that I was expecting one, so I just stood still. Listening very intently for that creaking or swooshing sound again. Then it was everywhere. I heard the usual accompanying noise. The gurgling as a person with a rope around their neck slowly chokes. I'm panicking, realizing they're still alive. The fall hadn't broken their neck, and that means if I can find them, I can save them. But it sounds like there are 10, 20 of them, all in the trees around me, choking. And I can't see anybody. A chorus of dying people around me. I'm running in and out of trees, so I end up radioing for help and some of my colleagues come in the jeep and power up a big, powerful spotlight, searching and illuminating the entire area. But nothing. Then my supervisor arrives. He takes us out to a tree, just out of sight, but well within hearing range, had somebody actually been there. He shines his light, and I could just barely make out the marks on the branch from where a rope had been tied. Turns out, that that was the exact spot of the suicide from last month. A particular suicide, by the way, which had been very grisly, as the coroner said it had taken the guy ages to choke to death. There was definitely nobody there. 
So what exactly did I hear? Being a park ranger, I have come across all sorts of strange things. Up until now, the weirdest sight had been a pile of skulls, all built up like some sort of totem pole. Thankfully, they were all animal. But the weird part was that the location they were found in was meant to be out of bounds to hikers. Of course, the likely answer was that it was somebody trespassing and pulling a prank. But there were no footprints of tracks, and they were piled up around six foot. Anyway, the thing I came across the other day was even stranger and scarier. It was again in an area which we kept out of bounds for anybody other than rangers. There are some incredibly dangerous ravines, and we have a storage area for some of the logging equipment, so you don't want your average Joe wandering about over there. In fact, one of the loggers was moaning that for the last week or so, whenever he went down there, his stuff kept getting moved. We were all convinced that one of the rangers or the other guys was just messing with him, but nobody would own up to it. I thought I'd mosey on down there and take a look. There was apparent heavy rain for the last two days. Nobody had been there. When I got there, I could clearly see some of the tools that had apparently been put away were now scattered all over the ground. I moved around the back of the cabin, carefully down towards where the ravine is. It was terribly muddy and slippery. I had to be careful. Between two of the trees heading into the drop was a deer. It had been strung up, stretched between the trees. Its body cracked open, so you could see every exposed rib, an empty carcass as it seemed like all the organs had been carefully removed. There was blood all over the ground, but no innards. I called the guys down, and we looked at it. We had years and years of experience between us, but never had any of us come across something like that before. Fair enough. The rain would have likely washed away any tracks, but there was literally no evidence of anything having been there, except an empty carcass. We were speechless, and I still have no idea to this day what did that and why. I'm not exactly sure what I saw when I was a little kid. In fact, I'm not exactly sure what cryptid this falls under, now that I know that cryptids exist and what their nature is. Back when I was about eight years old, my parents rented this old farmhouse in the middle of nowhere. When I say old farmhouse, this thing was literally probably built in 1901. It even had an old homestead detached from the house on the side and an old rickety shop that was probably built around the same time. Both of them nearly dilapidated and falling apart. But my parents at the time couldn't really afford much else due to my dad's poor job loss and my mom being a stay-at-home mother, raising me and my baby brother at the time. I had a room in the upstairs portion of the house where there was another bedroom for my baby brother, followed by a bathroom. I had one large window in my room in which you could look out and see the fields below and all the way to the road and behind that thick timber and trees. And while I do have a lot of great memories of living there and experiences, I also have some very terrifying ones that accompany that location. Many nights, especially during the summertime when it was so beautiful out, I would look out my window and just look out into the fields and the trees and the roads below and just watch as the sun drifted lower and lower in the sky until finally setting. One night, the very first time I saw this thing, because I simply don't know what to call it, it emerged from the trees across the road. Keep in mind, from the house to the edge of the road was probably, I don't want to say a quarter mile, because that's pretty far, but maybe an eighth of a mile. We had a long driveway, and at the end of the driveway was the road, and past the road was the thick trees. So, from my window, I could see the road and see this shape emerge. At first, I thought it was a person, 
but even my eight-year-old brain realized that a person doesn't dress that dark. This figure was a stark, stark black, and it moved very strangely. It swayed back and forth, and it didn't take steps like a normal person would. It kind of glided, or slithered, dare I say. Well, I caught a glimpse of this, and it stuck my gaze as I watched this thing slowly slither up the side of our driveway. Not exactly up our driveway, but into the adjacent field running parallel that if you were to walk up the field would lead right to our house. And this thing did just that, hugging the tree line on the opposite side perpendicular to the road, following up to our house. It was disturbing. The longer I looked at it, the more frightened I became, realizing more and more that this wasn't a person, nor could I really identify exactly what it was. It was so black that I couldn't tell you any features it had, because honestly I didn't see anything other than a general shape as I got to see it from a better angle and could see it a little more clearly. Again, I couldn't really make out definitive details, but I realized in horror that it did not have two legs like I had thought it did this entire time. But instead, its entire lower half was one large black mass that kind of went downward and bent into a long, what I say could be described as a tail. So its entire lower half was almost serpent-like, if that makes any sense, with the upper body of something that resembled a human. But again, I couldn't see any definitive features no colorings, no markings, nothing. It was just incredibly black, even in the evening time, where there was still plenty of light outside, at least light enough to illuminate any details that should have been there. I would see it disappear into the timber and be gone. This would reoccur every few nights at random, never in any order, time, or any other pattern that you could count. But... It only seemed to happen in the spring and summertime. One time, I was looking out my window, and this thing was literally coming up our driveway and got right up near the house, where I looked, and it almost got into a blind spot where I couldn't see it anymore behind a tree. I kept a nervous look, but never exactly saw where it went, and never tried to get into our house or anything like that. Never attacked anybody, never made noise, never really bothered us, but what was it? I'll never know. I never bothered telling my little brother, since he was obviously a baby at the time, and my parents, I know for sure, wouldn't believe an eight-year-old telling a story like that. So I just kept it to myself. But I definitely won't deny that it scared the hell out of me during the evening times to be up there, and a lot of times I would be out watching for this thing. But after that one summer, by the way, we lived there for about seven, eight years, when finally we moved. I only saw it that one spring and summer we were there when I was eight. To think back on this still creeps me out to this day, and I haven't seen it since. I'm gonna start by giving you a little bit of background information on me. My name is Travis and I'm 27. My older brother, whose name is Don, is 38, 11 years older than me. He owns a lot of real estate and enjoys buying places and traveling. Well, in the past, he has bought some weird things and locations. For example, this isn't just a weird location specifically. This is something very creepy that happened. He bought this cabin out in a more desolate area in Canada. I don't know if he had ever told me the exact location, but I think it might be north of Alberta. But don't quote me on that. I'm not totally sure. Anyway, I guess he went and stayed there a couple of times, but ended up selling it, not even four months after purchasing it. The reason why, well, terrified me, and I'm sure it will terrify you. Before I get into the story, my brother is very, well, let's just say he doesn't believe in anything. And I mean anything. He's about as atheist as you can get. That also includes things like, I guess, Bigfoot, or anything else like aliens that supposedly exist. None of that, to him, is proven by science, 
and therefore invalid. But I think his beliefs alone are one of the main reasons why this encounter shook him up so much. So, now onto the story. It was March, and he had gone up there to stay in the cabin with his then fiance, who, by the way, is now his wife. When they stayed there, being in a more desolate area out in the wilderness, they were attacked by something. Not physically, but while they were in the cabin, my brother told me that some large humanoid creature covered in dark brown fur with what he said had huge fangs tried to break into the cabin on multiple occasions. It tried breaking the door down, busting through the windows, but it never quite could. When I asked him to give me more of a description, since I'm the creepy pasta, scary story lover kind of guy, all he could really tell me was that it had huge yellow eyes and large teeth and fangs. He never described the description of a wolf or a Bigfoot or any of that and just said it walked on two feet and was really hairy and terrifying looking. And he also made a few comments about how ugly it was because it scared his fiance so bad. I've tried to talk to his fiance or now wife about it and it still terrifies her. In fact, so much so that she just outright refuses to talk about it. So, I've only ever talked to my brother about it, maybe less than a handful of times, and he, even he doesn't really have much to say. I think deep down it really bothers him. I can just tell by the look on his face when he talks about it. He usually quickly tries to write it off as something that could easily be explained, or is there some sort of rational explanation for what happened. When I had asked him to give me the full story, he told me that he went up there the night prior since they didn't get there till really late that night due to a long drive. They stayed the night, and they had planned on being there the entire weekend. Well, that day, they began to get the feeling, I guess, that they were being watched. But there's nobody out there, so my brother knew that that was virtually impossible, and it wasn't hunting season at the time, at least that they were aware of. Come the evening time, and that's when they began hearing strange noises, like knocking, grunting, and weird movements throughout the woods. One time, my brother told me that he thought he had heard something like a bulldozer going through the trees not too far away, wondering why would there be construction all the way out here and no signs of anybody. It was strange, and he told me it did not add up, but he just dismissed them and blew them off. And then, as the sun went down and he went out to fetch firewood, is when he saw the thing for the first time. It came approaching him out of the trees with its claws supposedly extended, reaching out for him. That's when he ran back in, locked the door, and this thing violently ran after him, pulling and wiggling on the door handle violently, trying to break the door down, and then slamming its shoulder up against the door as if it knew how to use the door and break a door down. And that's what he said was terrifying, he said whatever it was, was easily well over his height, which my brother's 6'1", so not too short, but also not a giant. If he had a guess, he said maybe 9 feet tall, maybe 10. He said it was very tall. Then, the rest of the evening, it would try and get through the windows, tapping on them, looking into them, scaring him and his fiance to literal death but it never tried to punch through the window, although it did try to claw at them and try to see if it could get in. He said it stalked the cabin the entire rest of the night, walking around, tapping on the walls, sniffling, grunting. He wasn't sure what to make of it, so they waited till they could, grabbed everything they could, ran out at the first sign of daylight, which, by the way, at this point, would have been about five in the morning, maybe six, and this thing was still around, apparently. They got in their car, and they bolted out of there as quick as they could, never turning back. I guess apparently they had left some stuff there, although my brother never really went into detail on what. Shortly thereafter, I guess he was able to find a buyer for the place and sold it, since he had only gone up there that one time from what he told me, at least with his fiancée. 
The other couple of times it was him, scouting it out, because I know he had been thinking about flipping it, but I also think he wanted to enjoy it, and he did the first few couple times. But then, that turned into a different situation. So, yeah, anyway, that's my brother's tale, and make of it what you will. But I believe him, especially as he's telling me the story. I can just feel the fear emanating off of him, and I hope, if anything, it's given him a more open mind and a fresh new perspective on life and what to expect. There was this one thing that happened back when I was a kid, and I'll never forget it. Even to this day, I have no idea what I saw and what it meant, just that it was completely and utterly horrifying. So, to go into the story, at the time I was staying at my uncle and aunt's house. They had a rather large place. They did have four kids, and I enjoyed my cousins and staying over there at the house. At the time, I don't recall ever feeling uncomfortable or experiencing anything weird or out of the ordinary, at least until that day. We'd been playing all day long in the woods by the house, hide and go seek, stick in the mud, all sorts of games. We made tree forts, we built dens, you name it. We played it, so when my aunt set us all off to bed early, not one of us complained. I was staying at the time with my youngest cousin, as he was a really sound sleeper. Literally, after his head hitting the pillow, nothing would wake him. The darn kid could go through a hurricane and not wake up. I'm sure we all know people like that in our lives. They could literally sleep through anything. I, however, was a fairly light sleeper, even more so when I wasn't in my own bed. So, despite having slept there dozens of times, I was still apt to wake at the slightest noise. It was sometime in the very early morning, maybe like 2 a.m., when I was awakened by what sounded like chattering. It isn't very unusual for us to sneak into each other's rooms and wake up in different beds in the morning. I wasn't worried. We were weird like that. But then I could hear my name being called. The strange thing was, it seemed to be coming from outside my window. And it sounded just like my oldest cousin. His name is Luke. Luke, being the oldest, was a bit of a show-off and was around nine years old at the time. I thought he had snuck outside and was trying to be an idiot. Come out, I heard. So, I quietly crept down the stairs and out the back door. As the room I was in at the time was at the very back of the house. I hadn't noticed my aunt's light was on in her room at the other end. So, there I was, out in the garden, pitch black, aside from the dull light of the moon. And then I see a figure just at the end of the garden. It looked nothing like Luke, unless my cousin had a massive overnight growth spurt and was now seven feet tall with long dangling limbs and what appeared to be some sort of bear skin. I couldn't make out any of the face due to the shadows and poor lighting. But as I stood there in shock, I heard it call my name again using Luke's voice. It told me to come here. That's when I could hear it more clearly. Even though it resembled Luke's voice, it sounded more crackly, more distorted. The best example I can give you is take a loved one's voice. Now, put their voice through like an AM radio, how it's kind of got that lo-fi distortion to it. That's kind of what it reminded me of, and maybe even being slightly off pitch. I knew in that instant something was wrong. I screamed, ran back into the house, and straight to my aunt. That's where the real Luke was lying on their bed. He was barfing. Since my aunt was busy, my uncle came running over to me, thinking that I guessed that maybe all of his kids ate something bad, and I was about to vomit myself. I felt like it right then, but not due to anything we ate, from total fear, of course. 
I told him exactly what happened. And he didn't even get mad at me or tell me I was making it up. He calmly told me to wait and he was going to take a look outside. When he came back in, he tried to assure me it was just a bad dream or a trick of the light. That maybe even I had a fever going along with my sickness. Well, I wasn't sick. And the following morning, I went back out and looked at the ground. There were tracks. The weird thing was, though, they didn't resemble footprints or shoe prints or even feet that I was aware of. They kind of looked like hooves, deer hooves, but they looked different. Why was this thing standing at the bottom of the garden? How did it know my name? And how exactly did it copy Luke's voice? Those questions I'll never know. I had a very strange experience when I was driving home one evening. My sister's dog had run away a couple of days prior, and I had promised her that I would drive around after my shift and see if I could spot him in the area he supposedly ran off. That was why I was out in the woods, when I would have much rather been kicking back with a beer after a very stressful shift. So, here I was, driving through crappy old roads with potholes and low-hanging branches, trying to wreck the truck to see if this dumb dog had managed to run off the farm and maybe end up out here. I had my high beams on, driving really slow, window down, calling his name and shining my flashlight out the driver's window as I'm cruising along. I think every animal out there was cursing me right then and there as I drove through, lighting up the forest around me like a darn carnival show. I could hear all sorts of noise and shuffling, Knowing that dog, I'm pretty sure it would respond to being called. Just as I was thinking about that calling it a day would be best, I heard a bark. I immediately stopped the car, called the dog's name again. Then I just listened. I wanted to see if he would respond and if I could work out just how close he was. Another bark, although it sounded a little off. I reasoned with myself that it had indeed been a couple of days and he was probably hungry and scared. Then, there was movement in the trees on the passenger side and I was just about to open the door and to see if I can get him to come over to the car. I was getting excited when it came tumbling out of the trees. I say it because it wasn't the dog, but whatever this was, I don't even know. It wasn't even a dog. It was around six feet tall, if it was standing up. But this was a different thing altogether. It appeared bent over on all fours, but not on hands and knees like a person would be actually crawling. It was on its hands and knees with its feet arched in the air, and it was bony. It almost looked decayed. It had rotten flesh dangling off of it, and I could see its bones and exposed ribcage, and the head was like a mess. Considering the posture and the way it was bent over, the head should have technically been facing the floor, but it seemed to defy basic bone structure and indeed gravity as it stretched up, faced forwards, and it looked like a grotesque skull with huge dark open eyes. And then, this thing made a barking noise again, as if it was actually mocking me. I swear, it had this look on its face, as if to say, fooled you. You bet I didn't open that door or get out. I knew I didn't want to hang about and see what else that thing was going to do or what it was capable of. It didn't come any closer. No way was I waiting around. It just stood there watching me, as I pulled my car into drive and sped away. I kept checking back in my mirror, not that I could see much from my rear beams, but it seemed to have not followed me. I drove straight to my sister's. During that time, I had just been checking out monsters in the woods. The dog had just turned back up at the farm. 
I have no idea what that thing was that I saw. But I can tell you now, there is no way in hell that was from this realm of reality. I believe it was from hell, and not a normal animal. I believe it was messing with me, and pretending to be a dog. What can do that? A demon? I don't know. My father at the time had a very small farm. Not a lot of animals, but enough to keep them to earn a small wage and feed the family. Obviously, keeping animals safe, especially the working ones that gave them constant produce, like the cows, sheep, and heads, was incredibly paramount. He and my mother were also kind-natured animal lovers, so there were always cats and dogs running around, and they were always adopting more and more strays. Anytime you saw my dad with a shotgun, though, you would know something would be attacking their precious babies. He would only pull the shotgun as a last resort. He didn't even want to ever go out and shoot a coyote, just because. They would always try and set traps, as if there was a better way, like scaring them off. But predators don't really work like that, at least from my understanding. So, one day, my mom tells me that some of the animals were being spooked. Not necessarily attacked, like physically, but she could tell that each morning, they were visibly upset, shaken. Don't ask me how. Apparently, something to do with not producing as much, like maybe the hens were too scared to lay eggs. Anyway, there were also these weird sounds and tracks coming around the barn and pens. Footprints, unlike anything they'd ever seen before. When they looked closer, even the pattern of the prints looked off, like almost as if this creature was coming onto the farm, sometimes on four legs. Then, too, in no distinct pattern, it was all randomized. It made no sense. They figured it was a person and an animal trying to step over each other's tracks to try and be stealthy. So, they put more traps down to see if they could catch it or them. Now, it might seem strange, but this was really upsetting to them as they worried for their animals, too. And because they're such softies, they were even worried for the creature they were attempting to catch, even if it was one or multiple. So, the very next morning, just before midnight or so, they were awoken by a horrific screaming noise, plus tons of animals going crazy. They come racing down the stairs, my dad grabbing his gun. Dad tells mom to stay behind, when he notices there is something in the trap. They just have no idea what exactly it is. The way he described it is it was almost like a deer. That was the closest they could make it out. But at the same time, they very much knew it was not a deer. He said it was around the size of a mature adult buck, only bigger, and skin and bones it had fallen over where one of the back legs had gotten stuck in the trap, while screaming, trying to free itself. Have you ever heard a deer scream? Well, I haven't either. My mom and dad stood there in shock, watching it. My dad was contemplating shooting it. He decided that this thing had some sort of disease, or was on its way from dying, just because of how much bone was exposed and rotting tissue it appeared to have. Animal lover or not, that thing wasn't right, and it was really scaring them. The livestock were all going nuts, too. As if that wasn't awful enough, the thing that happened next almost gave both of them a stroke. This was a few months ago, and my mother is still terrified about it. Just as my father raised his shotgun, this thing seemed to notice them for the first time. It stopped the dreadful screaming, thrashing, and stared at them. And then it charged. Mom and Dad both said right then and there, right before their eyes, 
the weird messed up looking not deer changed into a man in human form and he was able to reach day and use his hands to free the leg which was trapped now that leg should have been all mangled from the jaws of the trap and okay it was dark and they weren't exactly right next to him but from where they stood it looked like there wasn't a scratch on him he then ran off super fast into the woods behind the farm and as soon as he was gone the animals all calmed down my parents didn't sleep at all that night and ended up hiring local guards that they armed and put all around their farm on night watch for the few months after this well there's been no sign of him or it since I was hiking in one of those woods where there shouldn't have been anybody else around, partly because of just how remote the location was, and also because of how it was private property. I'm a pretty harmless individual, and I love the natural beauty of the property itself. So, I didn't really see any trouble in letting myself go on one discreet, secret hike through the forbidden woods, so to speak. The restriction of trespassing had made the forest especially wild and untamed. I felt like a pioneer exploring land that had never been seen before. The experience was intoxicating. The buzz of the moment was interrupted, though, by a sound that I nearly mistook for a chainsaw being started. It wasn't quite loud enough, and it was a very uneven sound. I couldn't tell if it was somebody's faulty machinery or if it was a mother, bear, giving birth. My curiosity got the better of me, however, and I decided to home in on the sound and try and find out what exactly it was. It was coming from the top of a hill. It was slow going on the climb up due to the ground being unfamiliar with human traffic. I crested the top of the hill and my heart nearly jumping in my throat when I saw a creature that was absolutely titanic, like a large brown orangutan with black fur and orange spots. It was laying down under a fallen tree, kind of shaped like an oversized bird's nest. This beast or monster had incredible amount of detail to it. The fur around its chin created something like a beard and it kind of wisped in the wind. It appeared intelligent, and this even lumbering giant could be, who knows, dangerous. It didn't appear to be overly friendly, though in its current state, it looked idle and relaxed. As I was blown away by what I was seeing, understanding that I might have just caught a snoozing Bigfoot, I went to pull out my phone, and as soon as I did, this thing, monster, Bigfoot, whatever you want to call it, was immediately alerted, sat up and looked around. I was afraid that it was going to hear my heart slamming against my ribs and my chest. It got up and began circling the perimeter of its spot. It didn't waste any time when it turned its back to me. I bolted, heedless of any noise I might make. The ground underneath me shook with the roar that peeled from the top of the hill behind me as it charged after me, very aggressively. I felt like I was crawling, nearly swimming as the overgrown sound was making it impossible to move at full speed. The footsteps thundering behind me were gaining quickly, and it must have been crushing every last tree and obstacle that dared to get in its way. My life then flashed before my eyes, and then things went black. No, not because I was devoured, but because I fell into a natural pit, twisting my ankle and pain shooting through me. But the raging noises of this creature sailed overhead. I, at one point or another, lost consciousness. It was probably only a couple of hours. I dragged myself and my ruined ankle out of the woods, off the property. That was a whole nother feat within itself. Thankfully, my car remained undisturbed and I was able to get home. I was much more shaken up by the experience than I had first thought. I developed a shaking all over my body that I didn't notice unless I'm holding still 
or trying to take a drink. I tried joining a therapy group for people struggling with trauma and PTSD. But of course, those groups expect you to be open and talk about what happened to you. I couldn't quite tell them that I was nearly mauled by a Bigfoot or a giant ape in the woods. I feel very alone with this experience, and I'm going to try and pass this story along to anybody who will bother to read it. Please, know that I am not crazy. I have tried to reason and argue with myself, but I know this happened. It wasn't a dream or a vision. I really did see this creature. And there was this one time a few years back, when I was out in the forest, when I saw something that I will never forget. I work for the Forestry Commission and was busy doing some research related work right in the middle of this large, huge expanse of woodland. I was busy taking samples of various types of dirt and even scat that I had found there. Now, scat always smells gross because of its nature, but I came across this large pile that smelt even worse and was abnormally large. It resembled human feces, but three times the size, and lots of it. I just remember thinking that we must have a gorilla in the woods. And that's when I noticed some tracks. They were huge, three times the size of my work boot. I'm a size eight, and these were super wide. And also, the indentation in the soil was at least an inch. The way they were spread out would appear that whatever was making them had an enormous gait and stride, also being able to walk pretty quickly on two feet, as these tracks were not quadrupedal, but bipedal. And I began to get all these images of King Kong in my mind when something hit me on the arm. I gazed down, and there was a small rock. Then, suddenly another... I look up, thinking what is going on, and that's when I see him. He must have been around 8 feet tall, and easily weighed about 25 to 30 stone. He was huge, completely solid. It or he was covered in thick black fur, except for his face, which was this grayish old skin tone, no hair his face looking like a perfect cross between an ape and a man. The huge hands and feet were visible, and they were also hairless. They looked just like our hands, no claws, nothing, just big, nasty black nails. He looked me right in the eyes, and I could see that his eyes were either really dark like a gorilla, or completely black. Not empty eye sockets, but the eyeballs were black. He kind of just made a deep grunting noise, almost kind of like a shrug, casually turned around and walked off. I picked up my bag and I ran. The sight of this creature and the behavior it was displaying, I knew exactly what I'd seen. There's no mistaking this was a Bigfoot, and I had absolutely no desire to be one of those people who stick around for photo evidence. I don't care if I had time. There was no telling what he was capable of or what he was doing. He was angry and wanted me gone. And when you're faced with an animal that big and powerful, especially knowing that they're not supposed to exist, well, you do what they want you to. So no, I don't have any proof, photo-wise. But I know what I saw. And I know there are many others like me that don't need a photo for proof. I was driving along one day when I saw something running across the field that the road was next to. It was a really large pasture, and it looked really large, but I couldn't see properly through all the trees. I don't know why, but I thought to start with it might be a bear, which is ridiculous. Bears in these parts don't get that big, and if they run, it's on all fours. This thing was on two legs running just like a person, a big one. Then it just disappeared out of my sight. 
I might not have even thought about it again if it wasn't for the fact that a couple of weeks later, I was on the exact same stretch of road, and lo and behold, it was there again. This time, it was a bit earlier, and therefore lighter, so I got a better glance. The creature was also closer to me this time. This thing was huge, like a giant. It must have been around 10 feet tall, and weighed more than me and my family put together. It was covered in what looked like long, shaggy black hair, and from what I could see, the face was nearly human-like, both massively exaggerated features. It was moving quickly, and easily kept pace with the car. Although I was driving pretty slow, in order to be able to get this better glimpse of it, I think it seemed to know that I was there too, from the expression of its face. It certainly didn't seem to be afraid. I'm guessing that if I attempted to head to the car into the field that it was in, it would have easily been able to escape. It also didn't seem particularly threatening, but whilst it was running towards me, baring its teeth, I got the distinct feeling that it was somehow telling me to go, to leave it alone, and it would leave me alone in turn. It was a really weird sensation, and just for a moment, I slowed the car down a little more. Then it opened its huge mouth and roared. That was it. I felt like that was the final warning. Like it was telling me any more of this and it'll come and get me. So I put my foot down onto the gas and got out of there, not wasting any more time. Whatever that thing was, it certainly wasn't ready to mess around. I drove back down the road, time again afterwards, but I never saw it. One day, just out of curiosity when I hadn't seen it in weeks, I pulled up the car and got out. Looking into the field, I did see some tracks in the mud. Those footprints were massive. And then I finally realized what type of creature I had been lucky enough to see, but not wise enough to hang around and make it mad. I indeed saw a Bigfoot. I was in Alaska in a hunting blind, looking to bag an elk. I was well up off the ground where an animal would not think to look. I brought my binoculars to pass the time. I enjoy observing nature more than I enjoy shooting it. My hunting is strictly a matter of survival with me. The natural world eventually forgot that I was there, and I was treated to an excellent show of feathers and fur. They didn't have anything to worry about, since I was only into getting more food, and I preferred to really kill only one animal if I could help it, as opposed to shooting anything. At the time, I wasn't exactly sure what I was about to run into. I lowered my binoculars after one long sweep. I almost fell off my blind. This weird square-headed mammoth creature was looking at me at the top of its head, almost reach up to my blind. It appeared to be an ape by the overall build, but there was a very eerie aspect of humanity to it. It was probably the most terrifying of all. The eyes were a rich reddish brown, just like living wood. The fur looked borrowed from all kinds of forest colored animals, weasels, beavers, wolves, you get it. It was just shaggier and far more coarse. It took a slow step in my direction and I aimed my rifle right away. I can't even begin to describe the emotion that registered in the creature's brow when I did that. The feeling it sent through me was electric. It understood. I knew what I was doing. The guilt that I felt in that moment was like no other. I lowered my rifle, but slow, hoping that it picked up on the cue that I was giving it a pass and a warning. I even tried talking to it, although I didn't expect a response. It bellowed a roar that could have easily broken my bones it was so loud. Afterwards, the creature ran off before I could do anything else. Look, I don't have any pictures to show for my experience, and I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be enchanted or traumatized. 
I won't be able to take this story to the grave. You seem to serve a very open-minded audience, so I hope this story does you well. Do with it what you will. Read it if you like. You have my full permission. I was driving home for Thanksgiving a few years back, and I saw the most strangest thing I have ever seen coming off the side of the highway. I'll admit that I had been driving for several hours, but I have never just randomly imagined seeing some weird thing by the side of the road before, no matter how little sleep I had. So, I'm like 99% certain that I did indeed see something. I just don't have a clue as to what exactly it was. At first, when I caught sight of something moving alongside the trees beside me down this long road, I just assumed it was any number of creatures that lived around there. Most likely, a fairly large deer. It did put me on high alert. You don't want to run into something of that size, especially considering it can completely total your car. I was also trying to maintain composure and not freak out. Just trying to be very aware that something was indeed there. I didn't want it to shoot out in front of me and cause an accident. I also slowed down just a bit in case. It wasn't nighttime, but it was getting dark since it was late November and late afternoon. Add in the tree coverage and it seemed like a good idea to put the headlights on. I don't know whether that alarmed the animal but for a short time, it ceased to follow, or so I thought. After just a couple of miles, I could sense movement alongside the car. It really did feel as if something was following, and somehow managing to keep up. Sure, I had slowed down, but I was still easily pushing 40 miles an hour, which is a lot for any animal to maintain. Then... It appeared to shoot off in front of the car, but still in the trees along the side of the road, so that I could see movement in them in front of me. I kept thinking again that it must be pretty big, trying to recall if a large buck can move that fast. And then I suddenly had to ram my foot on the brake as hard as possible, and thank you that I reduced my speed as it shot out of the trees and in front of the car. Then stopped in the middle of the road, right in front of me. Have you ever seen those moments in the movies where cars have to slam on their brakes and come to a skidding halt? Well, that's exactly what I did. And because I had my lights on, I was now right up close, and I could clearly see it was no buck or doe, or for that matter, anything that I'd ever seen before. It had scampered out onto the road on all fours, like you would expect, and sat there that was right in front of me. One, my car had stopped, and the beam of my headlights, it stood up on two legs. As it rose up to its full height, I could see it had a sort of body like a human, at least what resembled one, except it was covered in grayish, disgusting, scaly dead skin and it was really, really skinny. Scrawny. Made me think of one of those Holocaust survivor pictures. Malnourished and starving looking. Underneath that weird, almost reptilian dead skin, I could see its ribs jutting out. The legs were incredibly long and skinny, but you could see small tints of muscle. They kind of reminded me of a picture you might find in a biology book when you're looking for that muscular and skeletal makeup of a body. And that's what came to my mind. It appeared to have weird arms too, which it held up near its face, almost in a defensive stance. Rising from somewhere on its back again, they were only now visible, close up bipedal position, or these two very delicate looking wings that kind of had a weird glow to them, only because my headlights were hitting them. They didn't look like they could use to fly, though, or support the size or weight. It was just a strange-looking chimera, might I say. And the head was the weirdest. If you thought this thing sounded weird so far, it had a very weird humanoid face, but I can't really describe it. 
I didn't see a mouth or nose. Just two huge empty eyes where the eyes should be. Just two massive big black holes. I'm not sure how long we would stay there if I hadn't been honking the horn and somebody didn't come from behind. I checked my mirror and there was a large truck heading down the road behind me, which I thought was unusual because this road really isn't meant for truckers. When I quickly looked back at front, I saw the thing lifting up into the air and jumping back into the trees. I moved as fast as I could, letting the truck semi-fly past me, which it did, so I then sat there for a good 10 seconds or so before I felt calm enough to fly off the road. What just happened? What did I see? I've heard of crypto sightings myself, but never could I have imagined something like this. By the way, sorry for the story and the writing. I'm not a great writer by any means, but I felt it was important to get my details out, and I wrote this up on my phone, so hopefully you can understand it. Feel free to ask me any questions. Whatever this was scares me. My old middle school was one of those buildings that in the day it was constructed to look grand and institutional, but looking back, it kind of reminded me of a prison or maybe a medieval fortress. It was built to last, constructed of brick, and it had been in service for so long everybody was kind of surprised when it suddenly had to close its doors. If I remember right, something about asbestos, but I don't think anybody really believed the excuses. And so the place sat empty for a very long time, up until one of my friends dropped in on me much later in my life. We ended up reminiscing about our school days and I didn't have anything to look back on. He seemed to think those world of awkward years. Then, he talked about the middle school, but he was too worked up to accept a no for an answer and asking me if I wanted to go. My friend and I didn't even give the consideration of the time and day, but it was when we were in the dark parking lot and my friend was pulling a grappling hook out of the trunk of his car. I began to wonder if my friend was even all there there was just something wrong with the way he was carrying himself, with the way he was talking, and with what he was planning on doing. He proudly showed me the rope attached to the hook. He swung the hook like a lasso and then let it fly up into the air. It attached to one of the walls, very snugly. He volunteered to climb first. He made it up about six or seven feet before he dropped back down. He then encouraged me to try. I wasn't going to. I knew that somebody there would see me and get enough details to report me to the police. We tried to get the grappling hook back down, but it had worked its way far too snugly. So my friend just threw up his arms and said that we'd just leave it there. That made the entire prospect of climbing the wall a preferable outcome. It wasn't easy, of course, to scale the wall. I didn't exactly stay in shape, but I gradually inched my way to the top and I did everything in my power to not look down. The first heart attack I had came when I saw what appeared to be a large stone gargoyle that I had not known was ever up there. It had been hidden by the edge of the wall all those years. I held onto the rope of the hook with an iron grip and took a moment for my breathing to return to normal. The second jump of mine came when this creature appeared to open its eyes, which were lit up like two glowing rubies. And they were lit up with light of, dare I say, imprisoned souls. That's when it moved to my horror. Reached down, grabbed the hook, dislodged it, and sent me falling towards the ground. I only broke my leg and part of my hip, and we're both lucky we didn't go to jail. But I can assure you, I never went back around there again, and it freaked me the hell out. What exactly that creature was, I don't know, because after I fell and was able to look back up and see what had exactly happened, the shape 
or whatever figure I thought was a gargoyle, was completely gone. Even though it was complete black and resembled that of one, maybe it wasn't. What exactly did I see while I was up there? Is there a reason it was there? Possibly because the school was abandoned, but I'll never know for sure. Apparently, most people are afraid of getting lost. Me? I enjoy it. I enjoy taking wrong turns and ending up on long, winding roads with virtually no exits. I don't know if that means there's something wrong with me, or if that simply means that I have more gas money than most people. At the time, I was 26 and single, and had decided to take a road trip. Back in those days, my idea of a road trip was to fill up the tank, go to the edge of what familiar was for me, and then just keep going to see where I end up, usually end up exploring. I underestimated just how expansive the rules were in my chosen area of exploring. It had all looked much smaller on roads, but between counties in Illinois, I found a veritable wilderness that people in progress and time itself seem to have completely overlooked. The wildflowers that I saw growing there weren't the kind that were planted by the state. They were 100% sown and grown by the hand of nature. The winding roads had entirely one way, narrow with nowhere to turn off or around. So unless I wanted to drive backwards for miles in order just to backtrack, I had to keep going. The road became surrounded by light woods, and light woods became dark woods, and dark woods turned to utterly claustrophobic timber. I was beginning to wonder if I'd see trees growing in the middle of the road, but no such thing happened. And there was no indication that I was gonna get out of the woods anytime soon. I was okay until I saw a vehicle behind me in my rearview mirror. It was a beta pickup truck that had been brand new in the 70s or maybe 80s. I wondered why the driver trusted it to be on a location so remote. It didn't take long for the truck to start hugging my back bumper. Okay, so my sightseeing pace wasn't good. I sped up as a courtesy, but my friend behind me did not back off. They kept right up on me. And that's when I got nervous and began looking for anywhere I could pull off to the side. Of course, there was no such opportunity. We finally hit a stretch of road where the trees weren't so dense and not so tall probably due to frequent flooding. I pulled over and hung halfway off the road and waved my hand outside the window to indicate what I was trying to do. You know, being a good Samaritan. The truck just sat there behind me on the road. I tried to see the driver, but something about my rearview mirror or something about the light of the shadows of the trees kept me from seeing anything. They were just a lump of shadow seated behind the steering wheel that remained as motionless as the truck. At that point, I was beginning to think that the driver was a burnout and I would have to spell it out to them what I wanted them to do. After heaving a sigh, I got out of my car. The driver of the truck also got out. He had long gray and brown beard, wore casual clothes, and just looked completely dead. I tried talking to him, but he just looked at me, as if he never spoke English in his life. I wasn't exactly sure what to do, so I just motioned for him to move his truck and for him to get ahead of me. He stared at me blankly, eye to eye, and he truly did look dead. Not just like a corpse, but like there was nothing there behind the eyes. Not even a soul. I got back into my car waiting for him to get into his truck. He sat there, standing outside of his truck, staring at me. Then finally, after about a moment, he got in his truck and did a complete U-turn and left. I freaked out. I peeled out and left, as if I was surprised by my own hasty departure. After looking in my rearview mirror, indeed he was gone. I'm not exactly sure who or what he was, but it freaked me out, 
and even to this day, it's kind of killed my whole joy adventure for trying to find roads out in the middle of nowhere. I went back home after that anyway, and I didn't go exploring again for a very long time after that. Also, I don't go fishing anymore either. I grew up in a neighborhood that for the longest time I had thought was its own little town. I never did completely figure out which township it belonged to, if any. There were the two roads that formed a cross, each of them accommodating about six or seven houses apiece, plus the church on one of the corners of the intersection. Then, there were about seven acres of trees surrounding the entire neighborhood. And then, there was open farmland, as far as the eye could see, and as far as your gas tank could get you. The neighborhood, as far as I knew, remained nameless. But at the time, I loved living there. Looking back on that unnamed backdrop to my childhood still makes me smile sometimes. Sadly, it's also taught me how much of your fondest memories of a place can amount to little more than cardboard props used to enhance a photo shoot, the reality of a place being much more shallow or much more dark. I really looked forward to church as a child. Not that I had a mind for absorbing the teachings and the lessons, but it was just fascinating to see so many people come together out of some place so small. It felt like so much came out of a place that was practically nothing when you stood back and looked at it all. I even adored the other children I saw there. I'm not sure if they felt so strongly for me. They always seemed preoccupied, perhaps bewildered by the group of adults that would come together at the same time every Sunday. However, I would babble away to other children hoping that someday they would open their hearts to me and accept me as a friend. I did feel most welcome and loved by the lone priest that reigned the whole church. Many times, he even sang without musical accompaniment. There were a few rare instances where somebody found an old cassette of two of old organ music, but his voice was so overpowering and eclipsed the sounds coming from the thin old speakers. Everybody loved him. Just this last fall, it occurred to me to try and find that old isolated neighborhood. My parents had a hard time recalling exactly how to get out there. And once I had the general direction, my memory did the rest. Although I had not grasped as a child just how remote those two streets were, I was just met with a barrier on the country road that led out to my old home. This puzzled me. How did people get in or out with the only road in town blocked off? I arrived to find that things were exactly as we had left them, due in no small part to the fact that the neighborhood was now abandoned. Everybody was gone, but the houses and the church remained empty. A thought had occurred to me. Was there anything left unlocked? I began trying doors feeling like a thief. More than a few opened, the decor was still late 70s, early 80s, which told me that the exodus had taken place shortly after we had left. Maybe it even took place when we had left, and we were perhaps part of it. I was even more delighted to find that the doors to the church were all unlocked. All the other places I had visited felt like they were just frozen in time, but entering this church made me feel like I traveled back in time and not a second had passed since I had been there. I stood in the sanctuary for a very long time, soaking in the feeling of being a child. Then it occurred to me, for all the Sundays that I had been in that church, the sanctuary was the only part of it I had ever really seen. I wondered what the rest had looked like. And I began nosing around, shamelessly looking into every room and closet. Not that there was much to discover. It didn't take me long to find this study. And for whatever reason, the priest hadn't bothered to take much of his library with him. It appeared to be a fully stocked inventory of books. 
my eyes being immediately drawn to the well-worn Bible that was the size of most modern dictionaries. The tradition was to keep notes of important or memorable events. So I eagerly went for the tome to see if there was any sort of memorabilia from my own past. One of the first things I found was a newspaper clipping regarding a missing child. The date attached to the clipping placed it around the exact time that we were probably getting ready to leave. Part of me thought that the child looked familiar. It was a little dark-haired girl with eyes that were very dark. Something about her smile. I was practically able to reach through the shadows and pull up several memories seeing that same little girl in person. She was in church with me. Very often. But one day, I can remember her not being there anymore and asking about where she went. But nobody told me. Nobody would even look at me that day. There were other missing child bulletins crammed into the pages. Before long, I had dug out more missing child bulletins than actual children that I could remember ever being at that church. I wondered if that priest had been tasked with keeping his eyes out for the kids. I was about to put everything back when I noticed something unusual about the wall directly behind the shelf. The paneling was very visibly off. It was loose. Was there some kind of secret door? I began moving it, trying to see if it would shift. It slid. That was the most excited I'd ever been. Then, there was another wall behind it, and a very short flight of stairs. It appeared to be going down into a small basement with a very low ceiling. It was there where all my wonder and excitement died in the same place. I had to use the light on my phone in order to see. And that's when my stomach sank. I saw bloody handprints all over the walls. And as I reached the bottom of this low little cellar, there were bones, human bones, all throughout. Kennels and shackles that looked to hold children. I left, disturbing me greatly. I wanted somebody else to discover this. I guess it became pretty big news, and to my knowledge, police were still tracking down the priest. Finding that little death chamber was truly the sudden death of my childhood. Maybe someday I'll muster up the gumption to find out if those kids ever found, if any of them got out alive. A few years ago, a group of us went on a camping trip. There were ten of us in total, five boys and five girls, all of us teenagers. We were all seniors at the time, and it was like an end of high school party out in the woods. There was very little chance of any real shenanigans, just because we were in the middle of of a family campsite. No sleeping around, no getting drunk. But for the sake of our parents giving us permission, there were at least two separate tents. Of course, in the boys' tent, we thought it would be a fun idea to play a little truth or dare. We might have been good kids, but we were still teenagers. And as you know with teens, hormones rule, no matter if people are watching or not. So, after two rounds of truth that had already involved in doing what we wanted to do over to the girls' tent, the fact that I at the time had a year-long crush on one of them, I chose Dare. Well, I knew it wasn't going to be anything too scary. We were kids, and it wasn't going to be anything illegal or crude. The Dare at the time was to go out of the tent and stand out in the woods for ten minutes. No flashlight, just sitting in darkness. This actually was pretty nerve-wracking at only 17 years old. Your imagination goes nuts in a situation like this, but it was ultimately way less embarrassing than it could have been, or finding out that the girls knew my crush. I checked the exact time on my phone, crept over into the trees. I don't know if you've ever done anything like that, but time goes extremely slow when you're counting every second and praying nobody sneaks up on you. I think I was about two and a half minutes in 
when I heard a noise, not too far away from where I was standing. I had been here before on day hikes throughout the woods, with my parents. I wasn't afraid of nature in general, and there are of course certain animals and plants you want to avoid. Poison oak, bears, you know. But the fact there was a shuffling noise wasn't exactly the most terrifying thing. It could have been a little rabbit, or something like that. Three minutes in, and now the noise was becoming louder and closer. It sounded more like a deep, raspy breath, or a kind of panting. I was for sure starting to feel a little more nervous now, willing the numbers on my cell phone to move faster. Then, whatever it was, growled, and I felt a presence behind me. I froze for a moment. Then, whatever it was, let out this horrific, guttural scream. It was super dark, with just the minute glow of a cell phone, and I couldn't see exactly what I was looking at. Whatever this was, was about my height, and because of this, I was in no way prepared to consider an animal being that tall. In my first glance, I thought it was a person. I mean, that would have made more sense. However, as I saw more of this figure, they appeared far too bulky broad, and covered in thick, dark hair. This being also had long, skinny legs and arms. But then I saw the head. As I looked right into those huge eyes, it was staring into the face of a dog. A huge, two-legged dog. Its face was very reminiscent of that of a Doberman Pinscher, with a sort of bunched-up face and very pointed ears. I'm not sure how long we stared at each other, me being too afraid to move, and it staring at me like I was dinner. Then, it slowly opened its mouth and pulled back its gums, revealing a row of gruesomely sharp teeth that should never be in a dog's mouth. It was so many teeth that it was unbelievable, and the whole thing had only lasted just over ten minutes, and the other boys were about to high-five me, for being so awesome when I came rushing in and fell onto them. I told them what I had seen, and of course to start with, they thought I was pulling one over on them. One look at the pure terror etched onto my face, and I'm pretty sure they knew something was up. They heard the growling and even the low guttural sound, but it just wrote it off as somebody around the site being silly or trying to scare us. We barely slept at all that night, listening out for growling, half expecting giant claws to rip to the tent. I guess the girls had heard it too, and they were pretty freaked out, since their tent was closer to where the noise was. They also thought, though, that we were trying to scare them, so they weren't sure. Anyway, I don't know what I saw. A person in a costume, a werewolf, some wild animal. It was something but I know it wasn't something human. I will never forget this one time. I was on my way to the gym early one morning, and I saw something by the side of the road that to this very day makes no sense. So there I was, driving slowly, thinking about my workout, when I saw something by the side of the road. My first thought was deer, or maybe a wolf. Here? No. And as I got a closer look, it appeared to be some sort of mix between a dog and a person. At first, I obviously thought it was just some weird species of actual dog, because what the hell else was it going to be? A bear doesn't walk like that, or does it move like that? I also noticed that it appeared to be bending down, like it was eating something off the floor. I didn't really want to think about it too much, but as I got closer, I could see there was something unusual, a regular about this dog. As I was driving towards it, I tried my best to figure out what it was. To be honest, I commend myself for keeping the car on the road. 
I'm not sure how I didn't end up on the trees too. This dog was not only massive, but it looked wrong. I realized what was even more unusual than its size, and it appeared to be sitting. So until I was almost on top of it, I didn't even register just how much of a monster it was. And what was even more unusual was just how it was eating. My mom has dogs, and as you'd expect, you put food in a bowl on the floor, they eat it, usually standing on their four legs with their head bent into the bowl. That is normal, right? This thing was sat up, putting food into its mouth with its hands. Yes, with its hands just like a person. And that was also when I realized that this particular dog was basically the person's size and shape. Long hairy body, arms and legs, and a head just like that of a wolf, I guess. Maybe a little more German Shepherd, or maybe Alaskan Malamute. Somewhere in there. A damn person-sized dog, eating lunch, or whatever it was eating, with better manners than some people. So I drove slowly, really slow, just staring. I couldn't even stop staring. I was flabbergasted, trying to process and fully digest what I was seeing. But it just could not compute. I actually started looking around for, like, somebody hiding in the trees with a camera, thinking this was all some sort of really weird, elaborate prank. Or, maybe it was from a movie or a TV show. Maybe I was going to see a bunch of trailers and camera crew. Any of these scenarios seemed way more appealing than the reality of biting me. There was as real as you or me of a person-sized dog on the side of the road. I kept my eye on it for some time as I continued driving down the road out of my mirror. It never moved from that spot and just sat there continuing to eat. I ended up coming back from the gym instead of heading straight to work as I wanted just another look to see if it was losing it. As I drove back past the spot, there was nothing there. No sign of any dog, human, or person. So I slowed right down wound down my window to see if I could spot any evidence that I had indeed was not crazy and that this hadn't been some sort of waking hallucination. At first, I couldn't see a thing, but then I spotted something. A half-eaten fawn, ripped in half. That was more than enough for me. I put my foot down and I sped off. I've gone past her several times since, but I haven't quite seen this animal again. But I do slow down and check. Sometimes there's still roadkill that looks as if it's been ripped on and eaten on. It still creeps me out. I was in my teens the very first time I saw a creature in the woods. There were several of them. Although I don't know their lifespans, so there may have been some that come and gone over the last 20 years. They have never appeared to have been aggressive towards me, per se, but I have hopefully never given them any reason to. They just exist. Thankfully, for me and my family, we live pretty far out in the middle of nowhere. I'm talking miles and miles of fields and woodland. Not a lot else. There are other usual woodland creatures, but nothing that attracted any hunters or poachers. This particular family of animals mainly lives in solitude, what I hope. The reason this is important is because I believe that these are dogmen, and the first time I saw one, I was 13. I'd been gathering various treats for my mom's rustic country Christmas display, of all things, when I heard twigs snapping behind me. Having grown up, I wasn't remotely scared of anything in the woods, but made sure that I turned around very slowly, expecting to be a mountain lion about to pounce. Whatever manner of creature I had been expecting, it would have never crossed my mind that I would now be face to face with the thing that was in front of me. It was around my height, but a little taller at the time, so not quite six foot. 
standing on two powerful legs. Not in a fighting or begging stance. No, not quite comfortable in the position, indicating that was how it always stood. It was entirely covered in thick, dark, unkempt hair and fur. Its whole body looked wide, stocky, very ripped and muscular. If it got into a match with a bear, well, this thing looked like it could win. Its arms resembled that of a person, reaching all the way down past its hip area, and I could see long claws, at the time was, I would guess, six to eight inches in length. Then, it finished off with the most animal part of the creature, the head of what I would say would be a German shepherd. It was cocked to one side, and kind of gave me an inquisitive look. Its ears pricked up, and, just like that, ran off, but not before staring at each other. It gave me a weird, weird noise, which I don't even know how to explain. Then it ran off. When I looked behind, it still stood there, hanging out. I guess it didn't run off far. Although I carried on home running, and never gave chase, I think it was just far more curious about me than anything. In the twenty odd years since then, I've seen many of them, in varying sizes, shapes, and what I assume to be ages. They have never been aggressive, and I've never attempted to try and invade their territory but I've also kept it a secret. I've never really told anybody about them. I don't take photos, I don't sell my story, nothing. They always just seem to accept me, and so I do the same. Maybe it's because I respect them. I don't know. What I don't want, though, is hordes of people coming here to try and see them. They live their life in the woods, and I live mine. It does make me wonder... If I do live alongside them, what other creatures and strange cryptids live across the world, not causing anybody harm? For the record, I am in Maine, 